Together we say, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. Enter into his gate with thanksgiving, and into his court with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. And with the same breath we do Exodus 28 to 11, John 3, 16 and 17. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. For the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is in thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him and who might then be saved. is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord. Who then? Who then? Who then is willing to consecrate yourself this day unto the Lord? Who then? Who then? We whisper prayer in the morning. We whisper prayer at noon. We whisper prayer in the evening. So we can keep our hearts in tune. Because Jesus may come in the morning. Jesus may come at noon. Jesus may come in the evening. Let's keep our hearts in tune. As we bow on our knees together. Where we, where we are. Stay where we are this morning, today. We're going to bow on our knees together. We're going to turn our eyes upon Jesus. We're going to look full in his wonderful face so that the things of this earth can go strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. You know when all voice, other voice is hushed? When everything is quiet and our eyes are closed, then all scenery is cut off from our eyes so there's no distraction. That's where we are going to go this morning so we can have a full picture with our eyes closed on God. He has something for us today. He has something to say to us. But we have something to tell him. And so we are admonished to tell him all our secrets. Tell him all our sorrows. Tell him all our joys. Tell him what pleases us. Tell him what annoys us as well. He's a prayer here in God. So let's bow together as we lift our thoughts and cry out to him. Our God, our Heavenly Father, this morning, this afternoon, we come to you bowing in reverence, acknowledging you as our Creator, acknowledging you as our Father, acknowledging you, God, as our Redeemer, our Friend, from the curse of sin, the wages of sin being death. But we thank you, dear God, that through Jesus Christ, his gift is eternal life unto us. And so we come to you this morning bowing, realizing that we are unworthy, realizing that we can't help ourselves. And so we need somebody who had already prayed for us. And so we come to you this morning realizing that, yes, somebody prayed for me, have me on their mind, sacrifice their time, went down on their knees and prayed for me. Oh, I'm so glad that somebody Somebody pray for me. Thank you, Father, for the prayer that Jesus prayed. 
He prayed for Peter, saying unto him, Peter, I know the enemy have a plan to sift you as wheat, but I pray for you that your faith will fail not. And so that prayer for Peter is for us today. And so we are thankful that Father in heaven, the prayer reaches us. And so we are here this morning to lift up our hearts in gratitude to you, God, because you love us with an everlasting love. Your children have gathered this morning. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chasing and hasten his will to make known. The wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. We sing praise to our God because you forget not your own. And so, loving Father, we come to you today, weak, frail, and insufficient, but we are thankful that Jesus, Jesus, the sinner's friend, bore it all for us. He was wounded for her transgression. He was bruised for her iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him with his stripes. Oh God, thank God we are healed this morning. And so we come to you with humbleness. We come to you with humbleness. We pray, Father in heaven, that as we bow in worship, you will reach out and we will touch even the hem of your garment, O oh God, so that we can never and will never be the same when we rise on our knees. This is a special moment. As we ascend our praises unto you in prayer, dear God, we lift up, our, lift up your name. We have been worshipping you since morning. We have worshipped you in songs and we have worshipped you, God, in the spoken word. And we, we, we realize that we need to talk to you. We tell you our joys. We tell you our sorrows. And you declare that even before we call, Father in heaven, you promise to hear. While we are yet speaking, before we even call you, answer our prayers. While we are speaking, Father, you promise to hear. So hear us this morning from your dwelling place on high. We come this morning with different problems, different trials. Our circumstances are differing. Our faces are differing and so is our different needs. Father in heaven, you know our standing with you this morning. We too know our standing with you. We know where we are. And so God, the questions that you have asked Job, you are asking us this morning. And so we need to find up ourselves lining up with you. And so we pray that you will allow your Holy Spirit, Father, to speak to our hearts this morning, to speak to our consciences, so that our conscience can come alive and to realize that we have been too long running away from you. But we are thankful that you are still with outstretched arms, still saying, come unto me, all ye that are labor in sin, and I will give you rest. Even though today is the Sabbath of rest, Father, we pray in a special way that we will honor you, worship you in spirit and in truth, and we will seek that rest in you. will seek to rest in you. Spiritually, we will receive from you that strength that you promise. Father, we pray that our love for you will grow more and more. Our knowledge of you, Heavenly Father, will increase. Our faith will be strengthened. Father, our walk with you will be so steadfast and movable. We will always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that from you, dear God, we shall receive the reward of the inheritance because we serve you as Christ. And so as we worship you today, pray that you will accept our praise, you will accept our thanks, you will accept our worship, and Father, you will speak to us audible so we can hear your voice. We will give heed to the heavenly calling. Today you have chosen Pastor Duncan to be our speaker, to be your mouthpiece. Father in heaven, we know that you have used him before in time past. What you have done before 
We're happy to know, God, that you will, by all means, through your spirit, do it again. And so I pray this morning that you will lay hands, lay heavily your hands upon your servant. By your Holy Spirit and you will take just a piece of coal, a live coal from the altar of heaven. And touch his lips so that as he opens his mouth to speak, dear Father. The words that come from him will be your words. Will reach the hearts of your children. And as we worship you, as we listen to your voice speaking. Father, we will seek to humble ourselves and be ready to be charged by you to go forth and to serve as you want us to. Take control of this hour of service now, we pray. Forgive us where we have failed you in the past and make up for our shortcoming. And please to bless us in abundance as we wait at your feet to hear your voice. This is our prayer and this is our asking today. We make it known to you in your, the name of your son, our savior, Jesus our Lord. How different we would feel if God should breathe his breath, the breath of heaven afresh on each one of us. Amen. Breathe on me, breath of God. Yes. Fill me with life anew. Yes. We, we could never be the same after God breathes his breath on us. And I'm not talking about the bios breath, hmm. the one that keeps us breathing. You know, when he made Adam, he was still a corpse. Yes. It was still a corpse. It. He was not yet him. And then the Bible says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And it made him breathe. But that is not exactly the same as the breath of heaven. A man is not automatically a reflector of God because he is alive and breathing. There are many people walking around here that have no connection with God except through creation. So while we are breathing, we need to be connected to the breath of heaven. Amen. And that would make all the difference. My wife Rose and I are happy to be here this morning, this afternoon. Can you believe that? Last week I was in New York preaching in a church and they're about ready to leave right now. And their service was long. But they moved with alacrity and precision. The pastor told me that he has rehearsal every week with those who are going to participate. And if those who are asked to announce a song does more than that, they will never go back in this pulpit. Stand up, speak out, and sit down. And don't give a sermon along with your song. And I said to him, wow. But he says to me, you can say a lot, you can do a lot in a short time if you just do what you're asked to do. Amen. And when I get my next church, I'm going to learn from him. <laughs> yes, but this morning I promise you I won't keep you until the sun sets this evening. We should be out before long. Just two quick cognition to give to a company downtown that is helping people by the hundreds and the thousands free of charge. Yes. This company is entitled iDignity. I don't know if you have heard about iDignity. These people look for people in the community, especially in Central Florida, that have no identity, no birth certificates, no driver's license, no marriage license, even though they were married. And this company, with their own money, get lawyers and judges and immigration people and police people, DOT people, to, to, to contribute and to give back to the society and get them 
to file these papers on behalf of these people. And after three weeks, they hand them their documents as original. No charge to them. And once we discovered this company doing such a wonderful thing that the church should be doing, we partnered with them. And every third Thursday of the month, People from my office, including myself, go and volunteer to meet these street people and these people who are, who are all over the place without documents. And we take their information and we help to file for them and put a smile on their faces after three weeks. And so tomorrow afternoon in this program at 6, we will be honoring this company for what they're doing. You know, when we say honor, we don't mean honor like we honor God, but to recognize them and say thank you. Gracias por lo que están haciendo. Yes. Thank you for what you're doing. And you may know people in your church that have no documents. They can't get a job. They can't get a driver's license. And, and they have no documents. Let us know who they are. Amen. And we will try to help that way. Amen. So these, before you go, you can collect one of these flyers. It's about the program for tomorrow. There's a huge one on the wall outside there that has the same information. And you make sure you get one and be there tomorrow. Pastor promised me that he would be there. I hope he can fulfill his promise. That's Pastor um, Hardcastle. Thank him for his invitation. The other promo I have here is that Many churches, as I travel around the 300 churches in the conference, and that's why I don't get to come back here too often. And with 52 Sabbaths in the year, imagine how long it would take me to come back if I were to visit the 300 congregations. But um, pastors and church leaders are expressing concerns for their young people. I wish they could learn from Emmanuel. I look down today and everybody looks like a teenager. Even those who are not exactly a teenager, they look that way. And there are young people in the church. Thank God for you. This is a good sign, brethren. Young people, I beg you in Jesus' name, stay in the church. Amen. Don't let the things of the world pull you out. Because God has plans for your lives. Amen. But you have got to abide on board yes, to realize those plans. Amen. And you will be amazed what you will grow up to be in the kingdom of God if you only stay on board. Amen. And so because you are doing so well, young people, I would love to know if there are any young people here who would like to share a brief testimony, not today, but with me, I'm trying to put together to compile some testimonies of young people so I can share with other struggling churches what young people are saying that keeps them in the church. I'd like to ask a couple of questions like what attracts you to the church? What makes you keep coming? And if you are willing to share your testimony, I will take notes and build a compilation of testimonies that I will share with other churches. Amen. Do we have any young people that would be willing to participate in helping other young people to stay in the church? If you would share your story, not everything. We don't want to know your secrets. We just want to know what about the church that you can't resist. You have to come. Are you willing to share that? Lift your hand. Any young people between 20 and 40? between the ages of 20 and 40. You'd like to share your testimony of someday? Thank you so much. Thank you. Between 20 and 40. Thank you very much. We have two. And God will bless some other young person with your testimony. Amen. If you can save one. When I grew up in church, I learned a little song that says, If any little word of mine can make a dark life brighter, one word in a testimony can save somebody else. Amen. So after the service, I will see you and make some arrangement to listen to your testimonies. Thank you very much. God be praised. Well, a fellow was invited, not invited, he chose on his own to visit this church up the street there from his 
co-farm. He was a co-farmer. In Spanish, we say un vaquero. He was a rancher. He had a little ranch down the street. And every day he would go by his ranch and feed his cows. And a little way up the street was a little Christian church. He had never been in that church. He heard singing. He saw people dressed and going in. But he never entered that church. So one Sunday morning he decided to step into that building. And to see what church people do. To his surprise when he got in the, in the, sir, in the church. No one was in the building. He was the only one. I mean he was to be the preacher. The teacher. And the listener. No one else. He sat and he meditated for half an hour. Then he heard a sound coming from the vestry door. That's where the pastor's office was. And then he saw the pastor walked out. The pastor looked over and noticed this one fellow sitting by himself. He walked over to him and said, young man, what is your name? ¿Cuál es tu nombre? And he said, my name is Joe. And this is my first time in your church. Oh, are you from around here, Joe? Not exactly, but I work down the street from here. And I'm a cow farmer. I grow cows for a living. And after one hour of them being together, no one else showed up. Same two. Hour and a half. Same two. The pastor looked on Joe and said, Joe, it seems like we are stuck together for the day. What must I do? And Joe said, well, Bishop, I am not very smart, you know. But if I went to feed my cows and one showed up, I would feed her anyway. Amen. And the pastor got the message. And the bishop started preaching. And he preached. And he preached. Three hours he was still preaching. Four hours he was still preaching. And would you believe Joe was still listening? Then he made the appeal. And Joe gave his heart to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So it was not a wasted long sermon. At the end of the service, the pastor went to Joe and said, Joe, how was everything today? Did you get a blessing? Well... Bishop, I told you before, and I will tell you again. If I went to feed my cows and one showed up, I would not give her all the hay. Wow. Wow. I don't know if you got the message. But the bishop preached the whole Bible in one sermon. I have a lot of hay today, you know, because I have the same Bible. But I promise you, brethren, in the name of Jesus, I won't feed you all the hay. <laughs> Pastor Hardcastle and Sister McMain would not stop until they got me to find a date to come and visit you. I should have come earlier, but I had some administrative adjustment in my program. The president asked me to cover for him somewhere, and I had to change my plans. But thank God it's today. And I asked Pastor C Claude... Claude is his first name, right? I'm so happy for that young man. When I first came to Orlando, I met him. He was only a young fellow. And I never stopped until we got that fellow in ministry. Thank God. He's, he's doing a fine job. And thank you for supporting him. Amen. Not a perfect man, although he's close to that. So pray for him. Amen? Amen. I don't know a pastor that is perfect. The only one I heard about, I never met him. He left before I came on the scene, and his name was Jesus. Amen. All the others of us need help. But when I asked him, Pastor, ¿qué quiere que yo predique? What do you want me to preach about? He said to me, well, it's the end of the year. It's a season for thanksgiving and praises. And preach a sermon on stewardship, he said. I said, wow. That's a boring subject, you know. When I was a child and they said it was stewardship day, I would always call in sick. Because I knew my first elder would be preaching and reading from the good old red books and bore the people to death. 
stewardship. <laughs> but let me tell you, I went to God and I said, Lord, stewardship is a boring subject. Emmanuel are your people. You know what they need. You know what I need. And I want you to give me a message that is not boring. But before you share this message with the people of Emmanuel, my brothers and sisters, I want you to share it with me. Let it have an impact upon my heart, my life. And I prayed that prayer and waited on the Lord and he sent me to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I must confess to you I've read through the Bible several times. Since I was a pathfinder when it was required until I became a pastor I've read through the Bible several times. And I've jumped over these stories. But never before had this passage had such an impact upon my life. Until God sent me to this passage. Three weeks ago. It's a well known story. About a well known man. But I never saw. David in this way. You know everything in the Bible is for our learning. God meticulously designed the stories of the Bible. Even the stories of failure. He designed those stories for those of us who would come at the end to learn from others like us. How we all can depend on God to be overcomers and become porters of the gospel to those who need it. There is no wasted story in the Bible. And I'm going to share this one from this version called the Living Bible. I like the clarity of the words. But the message is the same as you would find in any version. Let me start with verse 1. Are you still with me? Heavenly Father, keep your people awake. Because it's a boring subject. Keep the preacher awake. And the message you have shared with him. Share it with your family here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Then King David turned to the entire assembly. Are you with me? Yes. Verse 1, 1 Chronicles 29. Then King David turned to the entire assembly and said, My son Solomon, whom God has chosen to be the next king of Israel, is still young. And inexperienced. That's an honest father. He's not sugarcoating it. He's not making his son out to be more than he was. He's telling his general assembly. All the leaders of his entourage. His royal entourage. He's saying. I am about to die. And my son Solomon. Is God's choice. To continue to reign as the king of Israel. But he will need your expertise. He will need your guide. He will need you by his side to help him out. Because he's young and tender and inexperienced. All right, that's an honest father. And the work that is ahead of him is enormous. Some versions say great. So he will need your help. Are you still with me? And skip down to verses 3 through 5. And now, he says, remember he was addressing his great assembly. And now, Yaora, are you listening to me? Yes. Because of my devotion to the temple of God, I am giving all of my own personal treasures to aid in the construction. Are you still with me? This in addition to the building materials that I have already collected. Now when David said, when I read this, I couldn't understand what went over him. For him to say, Lord, I am giving all of my personal treasures. No, that's a lot. If I and my wife stand up here in Emmanuel and say, we will give all our personal treasures. Don't rejoice too fast. All right. 
Because that's not a whole lot. Are you with me? Are you with me? Don't begin to say, wow, I'm going to get inheritance. It may not add up to be much. But when King David said, I will give all of my personal treasures to the house of God, that was something. And the next text, using the modern language, explains to us in dollar amount how much David was giving to God. Are you still with me? Don't go to sleep. I will call your name. In verse 4, it says that these personal contributions of David consisted of $85 million worth of gold. Are you with me? And I'm not done yet. $85 $85 million worth of gold and $20 million worth of purest silver. Are you with me? Yes. And I'm not done yet. Now, $85 million worth of gold and $20 million worth of silver is a lot, isn't it? Yes. Yes. I only want 5% of that. With 5% of that, I would pay off all my mortgage, all, right. all my bills. I would pay for all my pills. I would take care of my children's student loans that are outstanding. I would be able to shop for you on a Friday. Right. With 5% of that. That's a lot. But that's not all. Let's look at verse 5. The Bible says, verse 6 rather. He says, in verse 5, as he closes, he says, Who will give himself and all that he has to the Lord? In other words, which of you would follow my example? Wow! And in verse 6, we'll see how they reacted. Then the leaders of the clan and the heads of the tribe and the army officers and the administrative officers of the king pledged, one hundred forty five million dollars worth of gold, fifty thousand dollars worth of currency, foreign currency, and thirty million dollars worth of silver. And the list goes on. The leaders caught the fire. You know, there was something contagious about the leader's example. They saw him giving everything, and everybody signed up. Sign me up, sign me up, sign me up, put me on the list, sign me up, because I too want to give to God. What is boring about that? And that was a message that God gave me. Before I take my seat, I will share with you some lessons from that message. I won't have to say a lot for you to get the message, because sometimes a lot comes in one sentence. And if you stay awake, you will hear it. There are two important takeaways from King David's action right here. The first one was his outrageous generosity. He had no limits. He put no brakes on himself when it came on to the house of God. He said, I will give all of my personal treasures. Some people would hear that and say, He was losing his mind. When you give all, what do you have left? Well, let me answer that in the context. David was now 118 years old. And he was about to die. How long did David live? Only two years after that. He sensed, he had such a relationship with God, that he sensed that his time was coming to a close. And he wanted to go out of this life with a bang. He said, Lord, I cannot carry a dime where I'm going. I'm going to the place of all the earth, under the earth, and it won't be able to help me there. I have paid off all my bills and loans, he said. I owe no man anything. And I want to give you all that is left. So that after I am gone, my contribution can continue to bless your work after me what a way to go what a way to go and guess what David had a lot to thank God for you know how many of you know the whole story of David 
David is one of those Bible characters that should not have been. David should not have been. There was a time when King Saul, the first king of Israel, looked on his son Jonathan and says, Why are you a friend of that young man? Can't you see that he's the son of a bitch? And he amounts to nothing? Oh, you don't believe me. You don't believe me. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 20. And these are the words of... You didn't know that that word was in the Bible? Well, let me tell you this, brethren. The Bible is very plain. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, and if you notice, in verse, in verse 30, are you with me? I'm going to ask you to read it for me, Sister McMahon. Come, because they may not believe me. It's not good to disbelieve the prophet. Read verse 30 for me. From verse 30 to, to, to yes, the whole chapter. Ver, I mean the whole verse 30. Yes. Read, read it. Listen to this now. Saul boiled with rage. You son of a bitch. He yelled at him. He yelled. Yelled at him. Screamed at him. Do you think I don't know that you want this son of a, nobody. of a nobody to be king in your place? Shame, Shame on, on you, you and on your mother. And your mother. Thank you. King Saul, when he looked on young David, who had all the promise of greatness, he said, who, that son of a bitch, the son of Miss Nobody, to become king of Israel? Who do you think he is? That was the reputation that young David had. And for you to understand the context, I would have to go back down in this. You know what was David's full-time occupation as a young man? He was a shepherd. Now, I was in Jerusalem a year and three quarters ago, less than two years ago, the 14th of January. I spent 12 days down there. And in my time, I visited, Brother Smith, I visited Gaina, no, Cana of, of, of Galilee. And places like um, Nazareth and places like um, Jericho. And what I noticed is that in the early mornings, the shepherd, the shepherds would all have their flocks behind each other. That flock is preceded by another flock. That's preceded by another flock and a long line of shepherds with their flocks of sheep behind them. And they would travel for hours on the rocky mountains of Jericho across the Jordan Valley until they found green grass. And whoever finds the first patch of grass, who is at the head of the caravan or the sheep oven, what you call it, would get access to the first patch of green. And the next would get on the next and on the next. And they would sit and watch those sheep as they eat. The little lambs would eat, eat. And about 3 p.m. when the sun starts to change its direction, they would start preparing to head back home every day of the week. And it led me to interview a few of those shepherds. Some of them could talk English. Some could not. Some of them had a translator. But I was interested in the life of a shepherd. In the first instance, when I got into five feet of one of them, I would smell them. I mean, they are in a kind of three-layer outfit that protected them from the elements. It was cold. But that was their suit that they wore every day. They probably washed it once every six months. And you could smell them from five, me, five feet away. And that's normal. That's okay because their job is to work with stupid sheep. Show me a sheep that is sensible. When somebody refers to you as a sheep, it's not a compliment, you know. So don't take it as a compliment. The sheep like to run away and have their own way. And the poor shepherd has to be running around and gathering them. And the, lamb all, the lambs always follow the sheep. That's the work of a shepherd. And David did that. 
as a young man. His very father thought he would be a shepherd until death. His seven brothers thought he was going to be a shepherd until death. But God thought otherwise. Every day out there with those sheep, God was preparing young David for something greater than leading sheep. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, God will find you where you are. Never apologize for your upbringing. You may come from poverty. You may come from a life of struggle. You may come from wants and needs. But God's eyes are still on you. And where you are is not where you are going to end up when God is in charge of your life. So hang in there. Be patient. Trust in God. Be a good shepherd. Bloom where you are planted. Be the best shepherd. For you won't end up in, in shepherding. And then God would spot David every day as this young man would take care of his sheep. Doing the best job he knew he could. Until one day God sent a message to his servant Samuel, the prophet, and said, Samuel, King Saul is about to die. No one else knows it, but I know. I can see it in the forecast. And I want another king to take over when he's gone. But this king is coming from the house of Jesse. I want you tomorrow morning to wake up early and go straight to Judah. Go to the house of Jesse and tell him that God, I have sent you there to anoint the next king of Israel from among his eight sons. And you know, prophets back then, they would obey the orders of God. Samuel arranged his horse or his, or his camel and they traveled, he and his servants, to Jesse's house. When he got to Jesse's house, when he was approaching Jesse's house, he sent one of the servants ahead to tell him they didn't have cell phones as you young people do. I didn't have cell phone when I grew up. You did? I didn't? Oh, you didn't? No, I didn't have. <laughs> I didn't even have landline telephone to call ahead when I grew up. That's why my voice is so loud. I practice by shouting, Aunt Mary, I'm coming for Christmas dinner. Yes, sir. And they would hear you. So, Brother Walker, the servant got there in a hurry. Good morning, Mr. Jesse. Hey, good morning. Who are you? Where are you from? He said, well, I was sent by my boss, Prophet Samuel, to tell you that he's on his way. Prepare your boys. Prepare all your boys because he's coming today to anoint one to be king of Israel. And when Father Jesse heard that, in his mind he was sure which of his eight boys was the most fit for a king. So he prepared the first seven. He did not even think about the last one because he didn't count for much. How God works is beyond me. When Samuel arrived there, he noticed that all seven sons of Jesse were well dressed in their Sabbath best. The second one was the most elegant, more elegant than an elephant. He was homely and comely. Then Jesse said, Samuel, This is the one that I have in mind. And Samuel looked on him and was impressed and said, yes, this would be my choice also. But then he heard a little voice whispering in his ear saying, he may be Jesse's choice. He may be the prophet's choice, but he is not my choice. Next. So he put Bilda, whatever was his name, on side and he called for the second one. Who happened to be the oldest son. And he called for the next. Because each time he would hear the voice of the spirit saying. Next. 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 And when the last of the seven passed. He still heard next. And was dumbstruck. Lord why did I waste my time. This is the list and none is left. And he said not so fast prophet Samuel. 
turned to Jesse and asked him, is there another son? Yes, sir. And he asked him and he said, yeah, but he doesn't count. He's not even in sight. He's way over the mountains taking care of sheep where he belongs. And God said to Samuel, tell him to fetch him. The word used here, fetch him. Bring him to me. And Samuel sent his servant to search for David. And when he got in proximity of David, he shouted, David. He said, yes. The prophet calls for thee. And the first thing David thought, Sister White says, he thought of the welfare and the well-being of his sheep. How can I leave my sheep without a shepherd? But yet I have to obey the prophet. And he left those sheep. And he went all the way home, still in his shepherd's garment. I believe they smelled him from a distance. The others were well dressed. He was not. Yes, he was well dressed as a shepherd. He hadn't had a bath. He didn't put on his favorite necktie. And his favorite jacket to impress the prophet. Some of the most impressive looking people are not God's choice. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Who is next? God said. And then as David walked in the middle of the gathering... The Lord's Spirit said to Samuel, yes, this is the one. Anoint him now. He was not his father's choice. He was not the prophet's choice. He was not his seven brothers' choice, but he was God's choice. God anointed the Mr. Nobody to become the next king of Israel. When I was reading what he did for God, the amount of money he left for God's work, I discovered in a few verses after that, read the whole story when you go home, why he was so generous to God. He looked back on his humble beginning. He saw what God did for him. He remembered when the lions and the bears came to attack his sheep. God gave him superhuman strength and he ripped the lions apart. He ripped the bears apart. The other people were surprised. He remembered when Goliath came to defeat the, the Israel army. God gave him wisdom with one string and a stone to defeat the giant. He remembered all that God did for him. And never forgot God's goodness. And he said the least I can do to show my appreciation. Before I die is to give it back to him. Amen. Let's go back to the same chapter. And let's read what he says. Let's read what he says. Are we at First Chronicles chapter 29? Let's read what he says in verse 10 going down. He says. While I was still in the presence of the whole assembly. He was still talking to his assembly. David expressed his praises to the Lord. Yes. Oh Lord God of my father Israel he says. Praise to your name forever and ever. Amen. He says yours is the mighty power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Yes. For everything in the heavens. And everything upon the earth belongs to you, O oh God. And this is your kingdom. Today we adore you as being in control of everything. David was saying here, Lord, I owe it all to you. I should not be a king. And you know how long he was a king? He was the longest serving king of Israel. Seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. Forty long years. And it is said that under his reign, Israel prospered. Amen. Prospered. Amen. They gained victory over all their enemies. Yes. And David listed all that God did for him from the day he took him from the sheep. Yes. Now he was about to die. And he said, the least I can give back to God is everything that I have. Yes. What a stewardship. If you are bored today by this example, let me know. The Bible said he died shortly after that. Read the whole chapter and you will see it. Before the chapter finishes, he was a dead man. 
brothers and sisters, what can you and I learn from the story of David? We have known him to be a king. We have known him to be a conqueror of lions. We have known him to be a great shepherd boy. We have known him to be a good player of the harp. We have known him to write 77 of the 150 psalms and all of his psalms start and end with praises Praise. to God. Yes. Praises to God. Praise. Pray. This man was a madman for God. Yes. He praised God with the very breath that he breathed. Yes. I would love to be like David. Yes. He never forgot God's kindness. He was a humble man too, you know. He took no delight in what he accomplished. He gave it all to God. You knew him as the man who, 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 yes, he fell and God brought him back. You know everything about David. But did you know he was an example of a good steward? So these two points. Number one, he was an outrageous, he had outrageous generosity. The next point that I walk away with from the story is that David's Fidelity was contagious. He had contagious fidelity. What does that mean? I know you know what it means, but let me use my own words. In my research, that's the expression I came across. Because he set such an example of generosity to God, the people closest to him were smitten by the bug. Yes. Oh, yes. They caught the fever. And they too started giving to God. Amen. The best example doesn't come from words and what come from your mouth. Mm. The best examples that people are waiting for is what they see you do. Amen. Your Christianity must be capsuled in your action. Amen. I have seen big talkers. Mm. I have seen people with loud mouths. Yes. And when it adds up to the crooks of the matter. Jesus' words in Matthew 7 says... Not all them that said, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but they that do the will. That doing is important. Yes. Every time at New Year, I hear people making resolution. Before the end of the year, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. Well, it's not referring to people around here. Before the end of the year, I'm going to do this in the church. I'm going to do that. I'm going to renew my vows. I'm going to marry again. I'm going to do this and do that. Before the end of the year. Resolution. Resolution. But it's all talk. By the end of February. They break their resolutions. God is not interested in talks only. He's waiting for actions. He says if you love me. Do. Keep. Show it. He said, the world will know you are mine when you show love to one another. Amen. Not when you talk about it, yes. but when you actually do it. Yes. Amen. David says, enough for talks. I'm about to die, and I'm going to set the example. Yes. Today, you and I can look back and say, what a legacy. Yes. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you for that legacy. Well, you know what, brothers and sisters? David's legacy won't help us if we didn't create our own. Let's forget David for a moment and focus a little on me, on myself, on you. Look back in your life. Where has God brought you from? Where has God brought you from? Forget David. His story is his story. Can you imagine when God comes back and takes David from the grave? And he's about to give him reward for his faithfulness. How much that will be? You know, Jesus says that the more you give to God, is the more it is stored up in heaven's storehouse. It's waiting for you. God doesn't need David's gifts. Because he's the owner of everything. And he's piling it up. And he's going to match it. He's going to add to it and hand it all back to David. If he left this earth as a millionaire... When you see him next, he will be a billionaire. Because he put in a lot. And God is going to add to it. What are we putting in? Coming to church is a wonderful thing. But David took it a step further. He made a contribution. He said, Lord, I will be dead in a little while. 
And I won't be able to help to do the work. So let my money do it for me. You gave it to me in the first place. I like what he says, I think, in verse 14 or 17, somewhere there of, the, of First Chronicles 29. He says, all things come of thee, O God, and of thine own have I given to thee. It's not mine. It wasn't mine. From the beginning, it was yours. I just returned it to you. We grew up in the Adventist church singing that little song. Did you know that was a context? All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own as we give. That's where it is. First Chronicles 29. David says it. Lord, it came from you, and I'm going to give it back to you. What a legacy. What a legacy. What is your legacy? What is your legacy? Do you have a legacy? Your legacy is what people will know about you after you're gone. What do you want people to keep talking about you when you're gone? That you were a nice guy, handsome, wholesome, and winsome, homely and comely, more ele elegant than the elephant. What do you want people to talk about you after you're gone? Oh, she was the best dressed chicken in town. Oh, she was every man's attraction. Oh, her teeth were as white as milk. Her voice was that of angels. She must have been the angel that fell from the sky. Is that what you want people to talk about you after you're gone? Or he was a humble Christian servant of God. He lived a life that counted. And finally... There are four lessons that I have drawn from all this. Four lessons. Number one, every true Christian, every faithful steward of God, every child of God who means business for God, will recognize him as the source of everything. Amen. So what you have is not because you have your bachelor's degree, your master's degree or your PhD is not because you have a successful career why you have what you have. Give God thanks for who you are and what you have because he can take it away just like that. God does not like when we show off. Oh, it is my hands that did the work. It's my brain that got the degree. It is my effort that landed this job it is my money that built this mansion it is my investment that makes me big God does not like that because in Deuteronomy chapter 18 he says it is God's power that give it's God that give us the power to earn and make wealth don't show off on him Recognize him as the source from which it all has come. Life can switch in a moment, you know. Yeah. I know people who were doing well once. And they left God out of their wellness. And from their wellness, they ended up on welfare. Number two. Not only should we recognize God as a source of who we are and what we have, but we need to respond tangibly. David could say, Lord, thank you for everything. Full stop. In Jamaica, we say full stop. My children tell me to say period. I'm learning too, you know. David could say, Lord, I recognize that you brought me from taking care of sheep. You anointed me as king. You made me a king for 40 years. Period. He could do that. It was a choice that he made. We all have a choice. But instead of stopping there, he said, no, Lord, that's not enough. Not only will I recognize you as the source of everything I have, but I am going to give it back to you. And his action spoke. Lesson number three. He 
It says, create your own legacy and make it a legacy of generosity. Don't be mean and stingy with God. Don't be mean and stingy with the church. I have never seen a person generous to the work of God and die hungry. Praise the Lord. Amen. Have you seen one? I have never seen a Christian got poorer because they gave it to God and his work. Never. Have you ever seen one? If they got poorer and life got harder, it's not because they gave to God. It must be something else. Either they didn't have any business sense. Or they made people fool them up. Or they invested in the wrong thing, Brother Robert. But it is not because they gave to God generously why they become poor. I've never seen that. Never seen because when we give to God, the Bible says it's a loan. He will give it back to us. Amen. He says that even when you help the poor and take care of people's needs, you are lending to God. Amen. Proverbs 17, read the whole chapter. He says when you lend to God, he will return it to you. That's why I like to help you. Know. Not because I want God to give me back. But I can do better. Every time people with needs come around me, I remember when I had my own needs. Those of you who know me know my story. I shouldn't be here, you know. If it, were for, if it was left for the prediction of the people in my community where I grew up, I wouldn't be here today. I was predicted to die before my 20th birthday. And you ask me why? Where I grew up, young people never lasted. Boys would get mixed up in planting marijuana. We say ganja. Get into trouble, go to jail, go downtown Montego Bay and pick pocket and get shot by the police. That's how the boys all disappeared. And the people said, oh, this is the one is going to be just like them. But they are still waiting to see it happen. Hallelujah. Who could it be but Jesus? Amen. When I was 10 years old, I believed it. I believed in their prophecy. I thought, you know, I should hurry up because I only have, I only have 10 years left. But God said, no, no, no. These people around you are not the ones that determine your future. I brought you on this planet. I have a plan for your life. And they will not destroy that plan. And he saved me from that environment. And planted my feet on the feet of Jesus. And today we are still walking side by side. Hallelujah. 56 years later. And we are still having fun. Hallelujah. I go back to my community now. And some people say, oh, he made it. He made it. Yes, he did. Because God made it for him. Amen. I want to share my story to bless people's lives. Yes. Because the God who delivered David and delivered me mm. is still delivering people today. Amen. Don't write anybody off. Yes. Some people don't even talk about their upbringing. <laughs> they are too embarrassed. Mm. Well, I had nine brothers and sisters. And I will tell this on the television. I looked to my dad one day and I said, Dad, why you had so many of us and can't even feed us? Mm. My dad looked at me and said, would you have been the one not to want to be here? Okay. <laughs> you shouldn't come. Mm. The fourth lesson while you respond to God's generosity in your life, inspire other people. Amen. Share your story. Amen. Because somebody will be inspired. Yes. I know a young man today who is graduated as a pastor because he knew my story. I can't forget when he was in high school, he interviewed me in Montego Bay, Norwood, Montego Bay. And he said, Pastor, I hear about you. How did you do it? How did you do it? I say, I don't know. I don't know. No sabria de I cannot tell you. 
And when I graduated from college four years after, my parents didn't know how the tuition was paid, and I had no student loans. When I graduated, the business office called me in and gave me back a check for a thousand U.S. dollars. And say all your bills were paid. Who could it be but Jesus? These ten fingers worked on the farm for four years. And when I showed up for classes, some people could not tell. Because I, I, I looked dressed like the others. And my hands were clean. I would wake up 3 a.m. in the mornings. Well, a.m. has to be in the mornings. But 3 a.m. And I would go out and help to milk the cows. And when the sunlight came up, I went to plant potatoes. All for paying my tuition. And after four years, my college owed me money. Who could it be but Jesus? All expense paid. Who could it be but God? My parents cried at my graduation. My father was still alive. He couldn't believe the story. He thought it would take me 25 years to finish a four-year program. I remember I used to go home on holidays sometimes and look for him. And my son, my dad would say, son, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because of your younger brothers and sisters, I can't help you. I said, don't worry, God. Don't worry, dad. I have another father. He said, he said, who? Who? I said, I won't tell you his name, dad, because you won't understand. He was not in the church, you know. I had a heavenly father. There's a brother at the North Orlando Church. His name is Brother Everett Daly. I don't know if any of you knew him. Know him. He was the business manager for the college. When he called me in and said, let me check the record because you can't march, you can't graduate if you owe. And he checked the record. He said, wait, Conrad, let me check this again. And he's looking for a red light. He saw a green light. And he couldn't believe because he knew my struggle. And he kept checking about six times. And by the seventh time, you know the perfect number? He said, well, this must be true. I owe you, he said. Who could it be but Jesus? And that's why I have to be faithful to God. Every month I get my little check. If I'm on the road and my wife called me and said, yes, it just reached the bank. I pull over and I write God's portion. I am not going to that gas station. I am not going to that restaurant. In fact, I, don't, I hardly go to the restaurant. And if you're wise, you won't neither. When you go to a restaurant, you know, you, you know what you expose yourself to? Listen to CNN News and see some of these videos of, of what happened in restaurants. What you cannot see. It takes a lot of faith to eat from restaurants. I hear people say, I can't come to church because I have no faith. And yet they go to a restaurant. <laughs> you don't know who is cooking the food. What they put in the food. But you eat it. And tell me you don't have faith. That's more faith than you need. To be a Christian. Before I stop and spend a dime from that month's income. God's portion must come out of that check first. That's my habit. And since I started that eight years ago, my salary never runs out before the end of the month. All my bills are paid. Hallelujah. God breathes upon the rest and stretches it. Stretches it. Stretches it. And at the end of the month, all my bills are paid. Because God's money is not mixed up in it. It's taken out long ago. I shared this testimony in Grand Concourse, New York, some time ago. And at the end of the service, when we were having potluck, a young woman came to me, and she was crying, and she said, Pastor, I don't know you, but what I heard there today was God sending you to speak to me. That is my problem. At the end of the month, I have more bills left. And my money is done. And I've been struggling this way for years. And today God has sent you to show me my problem. Amen. As of today, the first that will come out of my pay will be God's portion. Yes. Another young woman came up to me and said, I need to speak to the pastor of this church. 
she, she was a, I don't know if she was a visitor, she didn't know the pastor, but I said, no, I'm not your pastor. I'm just a passerby that happened to be invited here today. She went to the pastor and gave him a check for $1,000. She said, God has spoken to my heart today. And I'm going to make up where I owe him. I'm going to make up. Next week I give another 1000 because I am behind with God and I'm going to catch up with God. Who could it be but the Spirit of God? And I know that that woman one day is going to say that it has made a difference in her life. And finally, you must anticipate a destiny of abundance when you do your best to be faithful to God. Jesus himself says in Matthew 6 and verse 20, let me read it for you. In San Mateo 6, in, in St. Matthew 6, the last verse, and then we can go home. Matthew 6 and verse 20. Jesus himself says it. And when Jesus says it, brethren, I believe it. Amen. And it settles it for me. Look what his words say in verse 20. Jesus says, But don't store up treasures here on earth. Where they can corrode away or maybe stolen. Does that sound like Wells Fargo <laughs> and Bank of America? Yes, they rob the bank sometimes. Oh, yeah. Jesus said to his followers, Don't store up your treasures where they can be stolen away. He says in verse 20, Store them up in heaven Amen. where they will never lose their value. And they are safe from thieves. Hallelujah. But he ends up saying, it will be given back to you. Because nobody in heaven needs your money. Nobody, not even an angel in heaven, needs our money. They are all richer than we are. Did you know that? They can give to us. They don't need our money. And the way to store up in heaven is to bless God's work with it right here. Amen. Because every time you hand a dime for the work of God, whether through tithes or offerings, the angel of God marks the date, marks the spot, marks the amount, and put beside it, faithful or unfaithful. Amen. Read what Ellen White says in the book, Councils and Stewardship. God knows those who are faithful responders from their hearts like David was. And if you want people to talk about you after you're dead and gone, let them talk these things about you. Make a legacy for yourself, but a legacy of generosity. You won't lose to be faithful to God. And if I bored you today, don't invite me back. Because when God gave me this message, I was not bored. Amen. I ended up my study that morning. It, has, it might have been 4.30 while it was still dark that morning when God gave me this message. I said, Lord, help me to be more faithful to you. Amen. And the next day, the Lord provided some money for me. Amen. Even before I asked him for it. Just to prove that I can have enough to be more to show more faithfulness Amen. even if you have nothing but you have the heart to be faithful Amen. ask God for something and see if he doesn't give you Amen. to test to test you because some of us have a habit of wanting to be faithful when we have nothing and when we have it we forget you know that man I have a son he's going to do everything but he has no money And when he has money, I don't hear him with any plan. <laughs> All the plans in the world when he has no money. So I said to him one day, my son, why don't you have the plans when you have money? And he smiled and he says, yes. And he's doing much better. But well, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, it is great joy. Read the chapter 29, 1 Chronicles. David says, I watched the people as they gave back to God and my heart overflowed with joy. 
He said, my heart overflowed when I gave, and I saw my people giving, and my heart overflowed again. Can you imagine what happens in the heart of God when we are faithful to him? May God bless you. May God bless me with a willingness to leave a legacy of generosity in the name of God. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, 330. Take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move. Before the final stanza, God has impressed me to make a special prayer because I believe somebody here yes. is making a pledge to be more faithful to God. I don't know who it is, but God knows your heart. And you will never lose. You will see a turnaround in your life. Before we sing the final stanza, the year is coming to an end. Soon the new year will begin will begin but only God can help us to put foot in the new year Amen. a lot can happen between now and then every day 33,000 people die around the world some they go to bed healthy and never wake up in the mornings that's what the stats say if you want to commit your life to be more faithful to God from this day forward I invite you to raise that hand and let the angels take your picture let the angels snap your pictures as those who are making a commitment to be more faithful to God. Amen. You will never lose. I'm not saying all your problems will be solved, but God will be responsible Amen. for those problems. Let us sing the last stanza and I will pray. Take my love, my Lord I pour. Take my love, my Lord I pour. Dear God and Father, what you did for David, you are willing to do for your people today. You took him from the sheepfold, smelly, distractive, 
mercy and you placed him on the throne of Israel not for four but for 40 years and he never lost sight of your goodness to him months before he died he gave it all back to you help us at Emmanuel to make a similar commitment for one day when our eyes are opened and Jesus Christ calls our names, we shall receive what we have given to him. Help that we will give it all so we can receive it all. Bless your people, all those who raise their hands to be more faithful to you. We are not doing this because they must give more to the church. No, we are doing this because their lives will benefit. Their lives will benefit. Yes. They will see God's hands more involved in their affairs. They will never regret. Be more faithful to God. Amen. When you come save us we pray. Thank you for the pictures you took with those hands going up. Amen. Take those pictures back to heaven. And show them to God. Amen. Because Emmanuel today stood and recommitted themselves to God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.